Thanks so much. It's a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, to be, uh, I was absolutely thrilled when they chose uh, uh, Ball Silly. It is a, it's a partnership between University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier, uh, Sigi. Uh, it's, a, it's a great partnership, and it's a great to see some old friends like Eric and Eric and Becca, and, and, and meet some new ones too. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, building an international wildlife refuge in sort of the industrial heartland, you know. So to get started, what comes to mind when you think of Detroit? When you think of Detroit, what do you think of it? Cars. Cars, automobiles, yeah. How about Kevin? Tigers. Tigers, professional sports. We've got some lean years here, you know. We, you got our hockey coach in Toronto Maple Leafs, right? You know. So, but uh, professional sports, what else? Motown. Motown, music, Motown, techno, you know, some incredible, lots of stuff, you know. So all of that is right. Um, but Detroit is also um, being known for some other things in recent years. And I like to sort of explain this from the perspective of paradigm shifts, that significant change in thinking that results in a completely changed outlook or view Everyone knows what the printing press and personal computers have done for paradigm shifts. Well, in Europe, you know, they literally extirpated beaver over much of the European continent. And they came over looking to Canada, the United States for beaver. Obviously, the Great Lakes Basin and Detroit in particular had a lot of them. And hundreds of thousands of beaver were, uh, uh, were exported from the Detroit area to meet this fashion demand. So, demand. So, Detroit really was responding to a paradigm shift. Then we needed to move people and goods to settle the West. And so they could get as far as Buffalo, New York, and then ships. So Detroit went on to become a leader in shipbuilding history. Uh, more ships were built in the 1890s along the banks of the Detroit River than anywhere in the United States. Uh, and I'm not talking about little ones, I'm talking about big ones. And everyone knows about Henry Ford and the assembly line and putting sort of the world on wheels. But there was another paradigm shift, and that was when uh, uh, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with the stroke of a pen, converted all civilian productivity uh, in Detroit to military productivity with one single purpose, that is to win World War II. So think of the number of tanks, bombers, jeeps, uh, ammunition. Uh, uh, so literally, Detroit produced more than anyone during that time period. So there obviously were lots of unintended consequences. Uh, during the fur trade area, era, we uh, extirpated beaver east of the... Lights on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. So there were these unintended consequences. And um, one of my favorite stories is uh, back in 1946 to 1948, um, you know, think of World War II and, and, and right after that, and what was dumped into these river systems, right, you know? So it was estimated back then by the Federal Water Pollution Control Administration that 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products were dumped into the Detroit and Rouge Rivers on an annual basis. That's an incredible amount. Uh, it takes one gallon of oil to pollute a million gallons of water. So that 5.9 million gallons of oil and petroleum products was enough to pollute the entire western basin of Lake Erie, all Ohio waters, all Michigan waters, all Ontario waters. It was a cold winter in 1948, and there were just uh, 
Much of the river had frozen over with ice. There were only a few pockets of open water. What was in the open water was oil. And the waterfowl in their migration came down. And all these ducks and geese landed in the few ducks and geese died in one weekend. So a group of duck hunters from the lower end of the Detroit River picked up the oil-soaked carcasses of ducks and geese, threw them in their pickup trucks, drew, drove up to Lansing, Michigan, which was the capital of, sorry about that, <laughs> the capital of Michigan in Lansing, Michigan, started throwing them on the sidewalk, threw them on the Capitol steps, called a press conference and said, how dare you do this to the place that we call home, the place where we're raising our families. You look back today and they're credited with starting the Industrial Pollution Control Program of Michigan. If you read closely on that lower right-hand side, it's uh, that sign there that's laying with the, the geese there, is it says Detroit River. Um, uh, Time Magazine, 1963, the, the uh, lead story uh, in 1965 is Lake Erie was dead. And that's probably poor journalism was more alive than ever. So much phosphorus going in, there were algal blooms. The algal blooms would settle out, use up the oxygen and decomposition. And the algae and dead fish would windrow ashore and it would take dump trucks and front end loaders to remove them from the bathing beaches. Uh, people started speaking out and these were the kinds of photos from back there. Here's oil. This is the confluence up here in the upper right hand corner of the Rouge and Detroit River. That conical shaped plume is the um, submerged discharge pipe of the Detroit Wastewater Treatment Plant, one of the three largest in the United States. Um, uh, here's some pickle liquor coming in from some of the industries. It's a bunch of wood with, uh, that's soaked in oil. Uh, and then here's a picture from 1969. Not only did the Cuyahoga burn, the Buffalo River, the Chicago River, but the Rouge became infamous in catching on fire because of oil. A worker at the Ford Rouge plant dropped an acetylene torch, caught the oil on fire. This is a picture, the last remaining picture of the John Kendall that's trying to put out a fire on a river. Can you imagine that? Uh, and then adding insult to injury, a graduate student came over from Scandinavia to look at mercury cycling back in the 60s in, in lakes. He had been studying it in Scandinavian lakes and looked at uh, the Great Lakes and, and looked at all these mercury cell operations that were pro uh, producing chlorine and caustic soda. The byproduct was elemental mercury. So he hypothesized that you would see the same thing out here. He analyzed the mercury content of, of, in fish from Lake St. Clair, and it was um, six times the safe standard for human consumption. He reproduced the data, took it to governments, and, and that became the mercury crisis. They banned the human consumption of fish for the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, all of the Detroit River, and western Lake Erie. Um, and that was 1970. And here's another archival photo. Uh, this is a, a boat with an American flag right here. This is the first Earth Day, April 22nd, uh, 1970. This is the UAW in the Detroit River. That's the skyline of Detroit River in the background. The, the vessel right next to this one is a Canadian one from the Canadian auto workers. And they um, were holding a wake on the Detroit River on the first Earth Day. Most people think of UW, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and UC Berkeley as big in the first Earth Day. Well, Detroit was big in the first one, made national news. So if you look at all of this, you've got uh, not only the 48 winter uh, waterfall die-off, but you had big ones of, in 1960 and 67. Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring. You had the phosphorus pollution of Lake Erie, the burning of the Rouge and the Cuyahoga Rivers, and the, and the uh, mercury crisis of 1970. That had an incredible impact in a very short period of time. The not only Earth Day in 70, but the Canada Water Act in 1970, the U.S. Clean Water Act in 72, 
the Canada-U.S. Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and finally the Endangered Species Act of 1973. So it's been over 40 years since all of that. So what has happened? You know, we've seen substantial reductions in oil discharges and uh, spills have been eliminated and winter duck kills due to oil pollution have been, are gone. Uh, we've spent billions of dollars with a B on the upgrading of wastewater treatment plants from primary treatment to secondary treatment with phosphorus removal. We've seen a 90% or greater decline in phosphorus concentration and loading from this plant the Detroit Wastewater Treatment Plant. And since 1960, there has been an 80% reduction in untreated combined sewer overflow volume in communities in the Detroit metropolitan area. Old cities have combined storm and sanitary sewers so that when it rains a lot, it exceeds the carrying capacity of a combined system and untreated waste overflows into rivers. That happens regularly in Detroit and we've seen an 80% reduction in untreated volume. Between the 60s and 80s, we saw a 4,000 metric ton per day decrease in chloride loadings. This was primarily due to process changes in the chemical plants, starting with the mercury crisis. We've seen a 70% decline in mercury and a 90% decline in DDT in fish, yet we still have health advisories on certain species and certain size classes. Uh, we've seen a 90% decline in DDE, the breakdown product of the pesticide DDT, and an 85% decline in PCBs and herring gull eggs on an island called Fighting Island, right in the middle of the Detroit River. Uh, and we've remediated over a million cubic meters of contaminated sediment at a cost of $154 million. If I stopped the story right there, you'd say there's got to be some improvement in the Detroit River. But that's not the best part of the story. Like many other places, uh, Detroit went over 20 years with bald eagles trying to reproduce, but they couldn't because of eggshell thinning and reproductive failure. So uh, we now, as you can see, we have nearly uh, 30 uh, occupied nests in metropolitan Detroit after a 25 year, after a 20 year absence. Similarly, peregrine falcons went uh, we had none for 20 years. They were reintroduced in 1987 uh, into hacking boxes on skyscrapers in downtown Detroit. And now the, uh, the tri triangles here in this graph show 30 young being produced in metropolitan Detroit. They even nest on the Ambassador Bridge in downtown Windsor, Windsor and it's a tourist attraction. But they're back in a big way. Uh, Osprey. Um, this is one of our units in the refuge right here. This is the Gibraltar wetlands unit. This is a high school here called Gibraltar Carlson High School. On three sides of it, we, res uh, we have wetlands, um, a pair uh, nested there in a cell phone tower back in 2009. It was the first time since we've had uh, um, osprey uh, reproducing in Wayne County since the 1890s. Um, um, here, we, we did everything humanly possible to destroy lake sturgeon. First of all, we built shipping channels, the St. Lawrence Seaway. So there were a series of rapids in the Detroit River, and we dredged down to 23 feet. We had to, they actually dynamited for over a decade to get to that point. Well, that, th these fish are lithophilic spawners, rock-loving spawners, so they spawned on that. On top of that, their nursery habitat were wetlands. So we have a 97% loss in coastal wetland habitat due to development. Uh, for a period of time, they were considered a trash fish. So they were going for fishing primarily for lake whitefish. They would want the lake whitefish. They would kill the sturgeon and throw them overboard. The final thing we did was we used to stack them up on the shores of Windsor, Amherstburg, and Detroit like cordwood. Now these are six and seven foot fish. Stack them up on docks and on the shoreline, very high, dry them out and burn them in the steamers, in steamers as a source of fuel. So they were looking for, for the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So 30 years, they were looking, all the fishery biologists, for reproduction of sturgeon and found none. Finally, in 2001, they uh, documented it off of Zug Island, which is the industrial heartland of 
of, of, of southeast Michigan and on a coal cinder pile. And that was the first time in 30 years. Uh, Lake Whitefish, back in 2006, we had them spawning for the first time since 1916. And back in the 70s, the Lake Erie Committee of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, Rob, you know, uh, declared that the walleye population was in a crisis state and today we're part of the walleye capital of the world and that's a 14.2 pound walleye which is not a rarity in the Detroit River. And we even have a few beaver back. Uh, beaver could not have survived during those oil years because their fur would get matted with the oil, they couldn't thermoregulate, and they would die. So during the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, they could not have survived. But it looks like the, uh, our best judgment or thinking is that they swam over from the Canadian side of Lake St. Clair, came down to Belle Isle, explored Belle Isle, uh, went to a power plant, the Connor Creek Power Plant, with no predators, uh, and uh, uh, they produced a couple of pups in 2009, and, and we now have them in at least uh, seven locations in the area. If you add that up, the return of bald eagles, peregrine falcon, osprey, lake sturgeon, lake whitefish, walleye, you even add in there mayflies and wild celery, it's one of the most remarkable ecological recovery stories in North America because of where we started, of how polluted it was. So out of that recovery, well, before we get there, obviously there's lots of problems in a big urban area, a big industrial area. We still have population growth, transportation expansion, and land use changes. Despite our best efforts in restoring habitats, we still have incremental loss and degradation of habitats. Uh, uh, we have a long ways to go in urban non-point source pollution. Uh, we still have the legacy of the Industrial Revolution and contaminated sediments and brownfield sites. We've been ground zero for several exotic species like zebra mussels and quagga mussels, and of course we have climate change in there. So out of this recovery, a group of people came together. Uh, in the middle of that photo, you see a gentleman with some gray slacks. His, that's Herb Gray. At the time, he was a member of parliament and happened to be the deputy prime minister of Canada. Uh, to his right is Senator Deputy Sabanow, and then another member of parliament, Susan Whelan, and then to her right is John Dingle, who happened to be the uh, um, dean of the U.S. Congress at the time, and to his right was Peter Strohs from Strohs Brewery and Strohs Ice Cream. So Herb Gray, John Dingle, and Peter Stroh got together and said, bring together some people from the United States and Canada who care about the river, who care about the environment and conservation. And if if we could do one thing for you, what would that be? Would you want a million dollars? Would you want a piece of land? Would you want us to build you something? So this group of one went away, 25 people from Canada and 25 people of the United States, and developed a conservation vision that called for creating an international wildlife refuge, something that no one else had, and asked to have it have the legitimacy, the standing of law. John Dingle picked it up, and, and it was signed by the president in 2001 as the first international wildlife refuge in North America, one of a small handful of truly urban ones, and founded on public-private partnerships. In Canada, they used a, a number of different acts to do a similar thing. So this is sort of what it looks like in a polygon. On the U.S. side, it extends from southwest Detroit down to the Michigan-Ohio border. On the Canadian side, it goes as far east as Pelee Island, that big thumb or finger that sticks out into Lake Erie. That's Point Pelee National Park, and there's Pelee Island. Um, so that's what it looks like on paper. Right now, we've used a, a series of tools to amass land for conservation and outdoor recreation. We in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have about 6,100 acres that we own and cooperatively manage for the refuge. Uh, uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. They have about 7,900. Those two uh, amounts of land go on a U.S. registry of lands. Then on the Canadian side, uh, Essex Region Conservation Authority, 
you know, conservation authorities, has about you know, 3,800 acres, uh, places like Holiday Beach, one of the three best places to watch hawk migrations in North America, and the city of Windsor has about about 1,000 acres, places like Ojibwe Prairie, one of the last remaining tall grass prairies in southwest Ontario. In total, we have about 18,800 acres. Our goal is 25,000 in the next 10 years, and that we feel that's very doable. This is the complexity of it. You know, it's just, how would you do this? You know, we are nested under the National Wildlife Refuge System, the largest uh, 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 land mass devoted to conservation in the world. Um, we use cooperative agreements with industries and others to uh, do different projects and to manage land. We have a nonprofit organization called the International Wildlife Refuge Alliance who can do things for us that we can't do, like lobby and raise money. Over on the right-hand side, we have the Western Lake Erie Watershed's Priority Natural Area. Wow, that's a mouthful but it's the institutional mechanism for federal, provincial, uh, regional, and local interests to come together to cooperate together in the spirit of the refuge. We have a cooperative weed management area. We have uh, several other things here that we use. So it's not a simple thing. Uh, so what have we done? Hard engineering, you can imagine, Detroit is older than the United States, founded in 1701. So we have lots of people, lots of industry. 31 of the 32 miles of the U.S. side of the river is hardened with concrete and steel. Concrete breakwater and steel sheet piling is hard shoreline engineering. That has no habitat value. It's zero. Soft shoreline engineering is the opposite, making it just as safe, just as stable, enhance habitat, make it more aesthetically pleasing, and even saving money. And this is what it looks like. This is the Rouge power plant here in the upper left-hand corner with a bunch of poured concrete and asphalt and taking it out and redesigning it and adding habitat both in the littoral zone and the, um, the riparian zone and out in the river itself. Um, here's one project where there was a breakwater that was put in in 1910 in the oldest county park in Michigan called Elizabeth Park. Uh, uh, they came to us and said, we have good news, we're going to replace it. And I said, please, don't go there yet. Let us help you make it just as safe, just as stable, we can enhance habitat, make it more aesthetically pleasing and save money. We were able to build a couple of oxbows in the river and provide some habitat features. So we've done 53 projects in the last 14 years, and many of them in very prominent locations where people, it can be really a, a teachable moment for everyone. This is the last mile of natural shoreline on the U.S. mainland of the Detroit River. It's called Humbug Marsh. Uh, a group of developers came in and said, what a great place for a subdivision, a amphitheater, a riding stables, a bridge to this island in the right-hand side there, uh, a strip mall. And so they were going to develop it. A bunch of people, citizens, spoke out and fought them through the permitting process. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner adjacent to that, I want you to see that little, that little trapezoidal sheet piece of property there. It's got a, that was an old Chrysler manufacturing uh, facility that, that was an industrial brownfield. So I want you to remember that. So th this group spoke out and they actually were instrumental in saving this and this became the cornerstone of the International Wildlife Refuge. So. Um, there's something called the Ramsar Convention. They identify wetlands of international importance, not national, not provincial, not state, not local. They have to be internationally significant and it has to be certified by in, you know, independent experts. So we compiled all the data on, on Humbug Marsh and, and put it in. It took three years of data collection and, and we're able to get a what land of international importance designation? This is the piece of property, that trapezoidal shaped piece of property. That's a picture from 1961 on the upper one of the Chrysler manufacturing facility in, in full scale operation. And we went, took that and said, what if we could clean it up from industrial standards to human health and wildlife standards, put a visitor center on it, 
make this gateway to the International Wildlife Refuge. And actually, Becca Robinson worked on that project a lot. So uh, this is the master plan here. Um, it was the first project in the world to clean up an industrial brownfield sufficiently to serve as an ecological buffer for a wetland of international importance. Uh, um, it's going to have a visitor center. We're about 80% done with it. It opens this spring. There will be hands-on, minds-on exhibits for kids. There's a theater room, a multi-purpose room, two classrooms, um, a wildlife observation and fireplace room, two outdoor patios overlooking the marsh. It's got all kinds of green features, and it is gold LEED certified. Um, here's some of the pictures of it underway. Um, and then we built this school ship dock. You know, there's a, in Michigan, there's this program run by Michigan Sea Grant that takes um, middle school and high school kids out onto the Great Lakes and uses it as a living laboratory. That ship will dock at the end of that. That's why it's out there so far into the river. Uh, we also have this placed uh, along the Detroit River. We've got the, this legacy of the Industrial Revolution. One of them was called the Black Lagoon. And this photo explains it. So this is a steel plant in the heyday, 1961, McClough Steel here. That's a source of oil. This is the Black Lagoon down here. This is a bayou or a uh, backwater in the Detroit River. So as water comes in here, a little eddy, water velocities slow down. When water velocities slow down, things settle out. We were able to go back in there and look, uh, do some core sampling, you know, six foot cores of the sediment in the river. In the middle of that core was nothing but oil, grease, PCBs, mercury, you know, on and on and on. So we said we had to go to the federal and state government and say, in the Great Lakes, there are a number of examples that if you don't act while you have it relatively contained, it can be resuspended in a flooding event, in a wind event, uh, uh, or something like that, and get resuspended, move out into the Trenton Channel, out into the lower Detroit River, and you'll never be able to do anything about it. So uh, we were able to get $9.3 million to remove uh, 115,000 cubic yards of contaminated sediment. Uh, uh, and you see the double silt screen curtain there during the operation. And then we were also able to, after that was done, we were able to uh, redo the shoreline and rename it Elias Cove, a neat project. Um, I mentioned to you that the sturgeon had spawned in the Detroit River. So after that, we said, wouldn't it be a great to do some experiments around this? The river is improving in water quality. The hypothesis is that sturgeon productivity is now more limited by habitat than quality, environmental quality. So could we build a reef? So we talked to all the fishery biologists. We talked to the Native American tribes. We talked to um, university professors. And everyone pointed to the Fighting Island Channel of the Detroit River that historically was known for its sturgeon productivity. So we went out and designed an experiment, three different treatments, three treatments, uh, three replicates per treatment, and built it. And the very next spring, um, it worked. And sturgeon came, and they spawned. Uh, two years later, we doubled the size of the reef. Um, uh, we have built now a total of nine underwater reefs for lithophilic, rock-loving um, fishes in the river. Um, and so this is an example, you can imagine, it's just a small point, but um, it's the first project in the Great Lakes funded with both Canadian and U.S. money for habitat. You know, it's not easy to move money from the United States to Canada or Canada to the United States, but that's what we had to do on this one. In this case, it was IRCA, Essex Region Conservation Authority, that was the pooler of the money to make that happen. So it was the first time in 30 years that they uh, spawned that portion of the river. Pretty neat. And a whole bunch of partners, 16 partners, including corporations like BASF and 
DTE Energy and Landmark Engineers all involved in the project. Twelve years ago, this is what looked downtown Detroit looked like. How many of you have gone to downtown Detroit? I know a few here have, you know. So you sort of, 12 years ago, this is what it looked like. I mean, the whole waterfront, you had three sets of cement silos dominating, material storage piles, you had parking lots, and you just had these abandoned buildings. And a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity came along with the improvement of the Detroit River. People started thinking about an opportunity to reconnect to it. And a group of, uh, led by businesses, not led by the city, but a group of businesses came and said, what if we could raise some money and reconnect people and build a Detroit River Walk? And that's what's happened. This is the largest urban waterfront redevelopment project in the United States by scale. Five and a half miles of Detroit River, wipe the slate clean, bring in some landscape architects and say, what if? It is such an amazing project. If you don't see it, next time you go to a concert, you got to go for a walk and see this. It is truly amazing. And uh, um, uh, yeah, it followed the principles of democratic design, so everyone has to be at the table and benefits to all. So it's one of the real examples where uh, um, it's making a huge difference. Our role in this was to be at the table and to try to be at the table on as many decisions as possible. So we were able to include, um, be at the table and advocate for soft shoreline engineering at five sites along the river walk. In the upper right hand corner is a stormwater retention basin. We were able to get a million dollars to capture stormwater along some of the roads and parking lots, put it into a, a stormwater treatment system and then let it filter it and go back into the river cleaner. Um, we do events like Kids fee, Free Fishing f a Day. We do an annual Sturgeon Day where students go from uh, station to station. They learn about what we did to destroy the sturgeon population, what we did to destroy habitat. How would you, how would you quantify the abundance of sturgeon in the river using mark and recapture and then how would you build a reef underwater? What would it look like using rocks of different sizes and interstitial spaces? At the end, we bring up a live lake sturgeon and they get to take a selfie with it. So it's kind of fun. We've done a unique birding spot on the river to get people interested and we've also got them involved in some citizen science. Uh, Rob, you mentioned today about uh, Phragmites. So, Every time we would acquire a piece of land, I'd go out and somebody would say to me, guess what, congratulations, you just got another 100 acres of Phragmites. So we were talking about the International Joint Commission released this week its report, and one of the priorities is on doing something about this. So we looked from Detroit all the way to the Ohio border and said, oh my goodness, if we just do our own individual thing, and yet, we're not the biggest landowner. You've got power plants, you've got metro parks, you have state parks, you have private property owners. What would happen if we were to bring them all together and we ended up calling it a cooperative weed management area? Bring them together, pool resources, and do it. Well, that's exactly what we did. We bought a, a, a piece of equipment here for $125,000 a marsh master to be able to do some of this. We were able to treat it with a selective herbicide, um, cut it, lay it down, um, burn it, and we've done that now on 1,200 acres. Here's one of our fix unit. It's called our fix unit right here in the green. Uh, it's 40 acres at the mouth of the Swan Creek. Uh, can you see all the Phragmites, this band that goes all the way across this photo? Nothing but 10 to 12 foot of Phragmites, it grows so dense at the upper end of the canopy that light doesn't get through and the more desirable species uh, can't compete, so it outcompetes it. So we sprayed it with a selective herbicide, we dried it, we burned it, uh, and here's the wet uh, uplands after and here are the wetlands and we didn't seed it, so 
all the seed base is still down there, including something called a uh, giant arrowhead, a threatened species called Sagittaria montevidensis. So pretty amazing recovery. Um, where we do this, it, it gets a lot of attention, and, and we actually get a lot of interest and more support for doing more. We also have been pushing citizen science to uh, a, a way of getting people involved in what we do. We've got these hawk watches, Detroit River Hawk Watch and Holiday Beach. Uh, they will see up to 100,000 broadwing hawks cross the river in a single day in the fall migration. So it's a perfect opportunity to do citizen science. We do marsh bird monitoring, Christmas bird counts. We have six important bird areas. Uh, we've got common turn uh, restoration and monitoring, and then, of course, all these soft shoreline engineering projects and the refuge gateway work are great opportunities to involve people. Again, we're the part of the walleye capital of the world. Uh, we have tournaments that offer every year $500,000 of prize money for catching fish in the river. We, uh, Ducks Unlimited, identified the top 10 metropolitan areas in the United States for waterfowl hunting. We made that list of the top 10. Uh, we saw, you know, Detroit River is the intersection of the Atlantic and Mississippi flyways. We have 350 species of birds. That's a big number. So we thought we put together a byways to flyways bird driving tour. It's 27 locations of exceptional birding, like Point Pelee National Park over here. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, uh, we've been building a water trail for the last 10 years, and we just made the top 11 list for the state of Michigan of the best water trails in Michigan. Uh, my, my lessons learned for all of you in this process. You need a compelling vision that can be carried in the hearts and minds of individuals, something that they can relate to, something that has meaning to them. Uh, adaptive management is, is a tool where you assess, you set priorities, and you take action in an iterative fashion for continuous improvement. You practice adaptive management. Build partnerships at all levels. Don't be afraid to experiment with building partnerships. Develop an ecosystem ethic through broad-based education, outreach, and stewardship. Connect people with nature. Build a record of success. Celebrate it frequently. Quantify your benefits, not just the natural resource and environmental benefits, but the social and economic ones as well. The Riverwalk, they had a $140 million investment in building the Riverwalk thus far. The return on that has been a billion dollars in economic uh, activity. That is helping get the next amount of money to finish the project. Involve the public in all actions to develop a sense of place and instill local responsibility for stewardship. Recruit and train urban change agents and facilitators. That's a lot of you in this room. And then a high profile champion, somebody like a Herb Gray or a John Dingle or a Peter Stroh. Where do most conservationists like me want to live when they grow up? You always want to go to a national park. You want to go to the, the boundary waters. You want to go out to the Canadian Rockies or something like that. Most conservationists don't start out wanting to work in urban areas, but we need to change that. What percentage of the people throughout the world live in urban areas? Take a guess. 82. 54% of all the people in the world now live in urban areas. What percentage of people in Canada and the United States now live in urban areas? It's the same percentage. It's what you said. It's 80% of all the people in Canada and the United States live in urban areas. Where is the next generation of conservationists and sustainability entrepreneurs going to come from? It's going to have to come from urban areas. What have we done about it historically? Very little. That has to change. Detroit River International Wildlife Refuge is an experiment in bringing conservation to cities and making nature part of everyday urban life. Uh, that's, uh, we are one of 14 priority urban refuges in the United States. Places like Tinicum and Philadelphia, San Francisco Bay, San Diego, um,
This is my favorite quote. There are millions of difficult challenges and delightful opportunities ahead. I think the only constraint is the willingness to dream, to create, and hope and feel undefended enough to face the tough questions and ideas that must be fiercely engaged at this moment in human history. If design is the signal of human intention, let me repeat that. If design is the signal of human intention, then we must continuously ask ourselves, what are our intentions for our children, for the children of all species, and for all time? And how do we profitably and boldly manifest the best of those? It's a guy named William McDonnell, uh, industrial designer and landscape architect who did that. That's our story. We're a grand experiment. Uh, uh, there is no there is no cookbook on how to do it, but it is a great opportunity. And um, uh, one of the things, the surprises for us along the way, you know, early in my career, all the relationships when we try to do some partnership stuff were all adversarial. But it's just been about the last 10 years where you can walk into a room and you can actually get people willing to do that. The number of corporations, think of corporations in a big urban area. Think of, like in Detroit alone, think of Ford Motor Company, General Motors, and Chrysler Fiat. When Ford goes abroad and travels abroad, which they do all the time, they're not from Dearborn, Michigan, which is their home. They're from Detroit. You know, Fiat Chrysler's from Detroit, General Motors. Whatever the perception of Detroit is, they're saddled with that. So if you're a polluted river in the Breast Belt, if you're just a degraded urban area, um, if you don't have some of the things uh, that people want, you're not going to attract and retain the next generation of employees. So that's really important to them. Uh, we're a grand experiment. It's an awesome opportunity. And uh, thanks for having me. So we have some time for questions. Um, we have a technological challenge because we are recording this and future generations will need you to speak into the microphone. Uh, and I'm going to have to do the Pony Express routine because you're going to have to speak into the microphone and then I'm going to have to carry the microphone back to John. So I'll be running around uh, a fair bit. So anybody like to begin? I have an opportunity for some insights from somebody who's really been at the coalface in making all of this work. Please. So, here we go. So, hand that down and hand it back. Thanks. Um, you talked about instilling an ecosystem ethic in one of, one of the middle points on that slide. Um, did it? How, do you think it's made a big difference in Detroit? And if so, how? All right. So, hold on. Okay, here we go. We're very low on the curve in doing that, right? You know, so obviously, but, you know, we have to start somewhere. And so, you know, we have, you know, in the city of Detroit, we have partner schools now where we're in the school, you know, uh, twice a semester in elementary and middle schools. Then they come out and visit us in the refuge or they come down to the Detroit Riverwalk and get an experience. And then we go back and do schoolyard habitat. You know, we are, uh, uh, we've just did uh, a week ago an urban bird summit and we actively, um, you know, to get young people involved, we actually pay for a substitute teacher, the gas for the bus and the bus driver to overcome an obstacle so they can get there. We're working to be in the curriculum of different schools. We're working really closely with this school ship program. So we're, we're, we're establishing some really long-term relationships to do this, to, to make uh, ecosystem, you know, part of the curriculum. It's, it, you know, we're, the nice thing about this is we're part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Wildlife Refuge System. We have over a hundred year history. We're not going to go anywhere. We're demonstrating, we've got a long-term commitment to do this. The proof will be, um, you know, what, you know, it, can we make it a livable community? So that, can we make it a place, place that's livable for not only humans, 
but for wildlife, and I guess that's going to be a long-term process. On the Detroit River Walk, we can't do everything, but we have picked out very specific projects where we, like uh, there's a greenway trail that comes off the River Walk that goes to the oldest uh, um, market in the United States called Eastern Market. It's called the Quinder Cut. So we've, we've got a couple of projects underway. One of them is completed where we've gone to the Detroit Garden Center, a bunch of master gardeners redesign a section of the Quinder Cut as a native plant garden, and they are the long-term uh, steward of it. So they sign a partnership agreement. The next one, we've got a church and a school who will be the long-term, almost like a adopt the highway, you know? So we're doing stuff with Detroit Audubon in, in um, birding education on a regular basis. We're not fooling ourselves. This is going to be a long-term thing. Uh, it's not going to be easily measured, but you know we're we're totally committed to it. Thanks for the presentation, John. Uh, my question is, surrounds the transition from hard engineering to soft engineering, or at least more of a balance between the two approaches and lessons you've learned along the way. Um, it se it seems to me that uh, in in our regional area we're We've been talking about more soft engineering or green infrastructure approaches, but as we saw at lunch today, we just added a lot of hard surface with our new LRT system. So what lessons can you share with us and how to get engineers, architects, planners, whoever, more excited about soft approaches? So what we've done is, uh, first of all, you know, we did the standard thing as we brought a group of people together and did a best management practices manual that had limited return. But we've gone out there and um, when we hear about a project in the, just the discussion phase, you know, somebody's gonna come in and redevelop a mile of waterfront. We try to figure out how do we get to the table? How do we be at the table where the decisions are made? If you're not there, it's gonna probably become hard engineering, you know. It is, it is not easy. One of the, um, the reality checks that we had, you know, I said that we had 53 projects uh, in the last 15 years. You know, we were really proud of that. We thought we were doing really good. So we had a, a GIS student come to us, and so we said, okay, go out and do all the, uh, the mapping for 1985, then we redo it in 2015, you know, and then we'll ground truth it, we'll go back and make sure that we've got it all right. And we, we were so proud of it. We're gonna show a net gain in, in shoreline habitat over time. Much to our chagrin, it came back. We had a net loss of a kilometer of shoreline. The big development, two marinas trumped all of our work for 15 years. And it was so disheartening, you know. So how do we, do, how do we get into that, you know? So we've got a couple of big ones coming in, in the near future, and it uh, takes hard work, it takes trust, you know, um, so that'd be my advice. Um, thinking back to the early phases of the development of the refuge, can you provide any more specific lessons on your point about coming up with a vision that will stick in the hearts and minds of the average person? and finding the high profile champion. How, any tips on, I guess, going about doing that? I guess uh, my thoughts on a, a vision statement, you know, some of these get so big and long that you could never, first of all, you couldn't memorize it, right? So you can't do it, but create an international wildlife refuge. You know, that, that was something that sort of stuck. So do that. Um, I think in these urban areas, there are people, you know, like you look at the Detroit River Walk, and um, we have two primary um, champions out there. One who was um, head of uh, worldwide real estate for General Motors. He only thought about real estate, and we said, how important would it be to have your global world headquarters on the Detroit River? But if you are an island and not connected to anything, what will that mean? How would, would you like it if you could be connected to a river walk and connected to communities and everything else? They bought in, and, and, and so getting that person. We also um, got a 
um, a, a woman who was a, a vice president of Wayne State University who had worked in the community for decades and had all kinds of trust and respect. She came in and became the executive director. So um, I, I think, you know, most of us don't have the ability to open doors and influence all the people we need to influence. But if you can find those champions and bring them on board and they can help open those doors, they can help, you know, start discussions on funding in the right circles, they can also help attract media attention, you know. Becca, you know how many times we'd use John Dingle or somebody like that just so that we get media attention to be able to tell a story and do that. So uh, I'm a big believer in those high profile champions and, 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 and uh, uh, they're out there. It could be somebody, you know, I've seen some places where they've had a musician do it, you know. They've had a, um, just somebody who people know and, and somebody who they trust. Um, I have a question that may be outside of your purview, but I'm just wondering if anybody has looked at the impact on property values surrounding the refuge? Yes, um, we've looked at, um, you know, that one contaminated sediment spot, that black lagoon, you know, you can imagine that was kind of like a, a millstone around a community's neck. And we've looked, gone back and looked at the property values in the immediate area of that. The, the immediate property owners during the process were against us. They said, you're going to resuspend this stuff, you're going to make it worse, and you're going to decrease our property values. They now are our biggest champions. They've come back. There's lots of economic data on, on you know, proximity to uh, urban refuges proximity to greenway trails. The closer you are, the higher the property value. Then that gets into the gentrification issue too, you know, and then how do we make it livable? How do we make it, um, you know, as well? So, but um, there's a good study uh, on the economic benefits of refuges. It's a national study done every five years. It's called Banking on Nature. So if you do just Google search banking on nature, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, it, it's like a corporation, the return on this. If you think of, you know, hiking, fishing, hunting, birding, you know, all of this combined, it's, 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 it's billions and billions, yeah. So, John, something occurred to me as you were talking. You've organized, uh, or the organizations you work with have organized a lot of citizen science. How do the sort of the line professional agencies that also work on these areas, federal, state, local, regional, or whatever, how do they view the kinds of citizen science that you're organizing? Do they view it as a public engagement, public relations thing? You know, thank you very much. We'll just put that over here. Or, or do they view it as, as a legitimate source of information that they can integrate into their work? The answer is the former. You know, they view it as a nice citizen engagement, unfortunately. So what we've tried to do is how do you take these data and actually make sure managers are using them to make decisions with? So we've spent a lot of time, we've actually adopted this Detroit River Hawk Watch. We raise money each year to have a paid counter come in for four months from September through the end of December to help organize and you know it's quite an art form to look in the sky and see all these kettles and figure out which species and how, how do you do estimation and everything. So those data get put into something called Humana, Hawk Migration Association of North America. And there's this nonprofit that's out there that's a bunch of statisticians and ornithologists, a bunch of bird geeks that do nothing but think on a continental scale about these hawk watches. So that citizens come in, work with a paid counter, they get trained, they see all the 
The data goes in here. They calculate raptor indices. They calculate status and trends and how the data come back. We're working real hard to make sure we show the citizens how their, the data they've just collected are being used. Um, interesting, this um, Hawk Migration Association of North America is located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at, uh, and um, we've just recruited them, and they're going to be in our visitor center. Is that cool? So yeah, so um, the common turn uh, projects, we've got a big citizen science compound. You can imagine building gravel substrate, you know, particular kind with a certain amount of cover for these birds that come up from South America and Central America and to, 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 to nest and produce young and then go back. And so we're working real hard to institutionalize that um, and, 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 and uh, uh, getting both bird people, you know, interest birders, and, and then uh, trained biologists from management agencies and universities to do that as well. Um, yeah, those are a couple of examples. All right, thank you very much. I'm looking at our uh, clock, and I think it's time to bring our session to a close here. I would like to uh, ask you to join me in thanking John once again for a terrific talk. I'm, I'm actually surprised that your organization lets you travel. You haven't really been tooting your own horn, but it's pretty clear here that you're absolutely essential to the success of all of these things. So thank you very much, John. The Water Institute always has a small token. Thank you, thank you. very much. Yep. You. Um, a little bit of promo before we all go. So the Water Institute has a very busy and diverse Water Talks series for the winter 18 term. So watch your emails, watch your calendars. On January 11th, 2018, we have Dr. Barbara Sherwood Lolar, who is the University Professor in Earth Science at the University of Toronto. And her talk sounds absolutely fascinating, Exploration of the Earth's Deep Hydrogeosphere and Subsurface Microbial Life. Um, so that's going to be our opening session is January 11th, 2018, uh, one of uh, an exciting series of talks we've organized for the winter term. So thank you, everybody, for coming up, uh, and uh, all the best for the rest of the day.